production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Frazier, the People's Convention, and more tonight on Behind the Headlines. <laughs> Barnes with the Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by a roundtable of journalists, starting with Jared Boyd with the Daily Memphian. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bill Drees, also with the Daily Memphian. Thank you for being here. And Toby Sells is news editor with the Memphis Flyers. Thanks for being here again. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll start in Frazier and, and kind of talk through um, maybe not some of what we've learned since, what we're trying to learn since what happened on, um, what was it Wednesday night? Um, this, we taped this Friday morning. So as of Friday morning, Bill, uh, what, do, what, what is next with investigations, with, with next steps? And we'll, we'll kind of delve deeper and deeper, but what's next? The, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation continues its investigation into the fatal shooting of Brandon Weber, uh, who was being arrested by a federal task force for the U.S. Marshals Service uh, for a, an accusation of a violent robbery in Mississippi. Uh, so that investigation continues. If it follows the pattern of past investigations, it will take quite some time for that to complete. Um, in Frazier itself, as we taped this on a Friday morning overnight, uh, Memphis police uh, uh, went to a different plan for coverage of that particular area and other parts of the city because of what happened on Wednesday evening. There were no one-man police cars. It, it, it's what is called a level three, uh, two police officers to a car. Uh, those kind of measures taken. And there um, were no protests or reactions of note last night? No. Yeah. There, Which there, was a big worry, not. right? I mean, mm -hmm. after what had happened and the protests and the tear gas and the rock throwing and everything that went, right. that went and, haywire and, on Wednesday. Yeah, and, and reaction, meanwhile, it is growing from a number of different fronts. Uh, the national NAACP says it is watching the developments very closely. The Tennessee ACLU says it has some questions about why a federal task force was involved in coming here in all of this. Uh, there are expressions of concern. There are, there are many questions about what happened uh, in the initial incident and what has happened since then. And Jared, you were you have a story up today about Frazier. You talked to a lot of community leaders in Frazier, and many of whom it seems said this is not fully indicative of who we are as Frazier. Sure. Well, it was, there was actually a Frazier Exchange Club meeting yesterday. A lot of media was there. Uh, I'm not sure how often media is attending, how often they are at meetings like that. Uh, I'm sure not often. So there was a reason we were there. And I think that the leaders who are typically at those meetings that are typically talking about business developments and community news, uh, even things going on in the school system uh, in Frazier, they invited us because they wanted a message to be clear and they wanted to, to stand in solidarity between pastors, uh, people who work in nonprofit organizations in that neighborhood and business owners and homeowners who are concerned. They wanted to make sure that they got out in front of uh, this this uh, incident and they wanted to make sure that they sent a clear message that uh, Frazier isn't a community, at least they, they, they feel that Frazier is not a community that uh, uh, an incident like this is indicative of. Yeah. There's the, a, it's a city, it's a, an area with a tremendous amount of pride. I mean, it's it's ironic that the governor was there earlier in the, the week, day before, the day yeah. before, talking about a, a reentry program with, with, with convicts, talking about um, education, if I'm not mistaken. Summer talking, youth programs. Summer youth programs. In I mean, and, in, in, this, in this specific area where this happened right. one day later. Right. Sure. Tell me your thoughts on, on the week that was. It was a... Uh, uh, well, it was, it was a sad, kind of a, a crazy week, um, and I think the questions uh, that are left behind are the ones that the ACLU put out in a statement on Thursday. It said, uh, were attempts made at de-escalating or, or resolving the situation in different ways, uh, and was shooting Mr. Weber over a dozen times if reports are accurate, really necessary? And I think that's what we're all struggling with, the response to this. Um, and also, as Bill said, you know, why, why was the, you know, the feds, why were they, uh, uh, why were they there? Uh, to try to pick up this guy. And so we're left with a lot of stuff and, and that's what we're gonna uh, have to deal with going forward. 
Well, one thing on that, since we, a number of us have brought that up, that, that um, when that first came out, that a U.S. Marshals Task Force was involved, it wasn't the, the local police. It came out, yet, I believe it was yesterday, that the Herm Hernando District Attorney, they were trying to pick up Brandon Weber on accusation of some charges. Is that right, Bill? And yes. that, that because it's across state lines, I mean, we sort of forget that because yeah. Mississippi is just right, you know, 20 minutes down the road. It's mm -hmm. actually across state lines. So the, the U.S. Marshals, they were very serious, very horrifying accusations against this it, it, it was a violent robbery. Someone's car was taken from them. They were shot five times. However, there, there are instances where police departments contact another police department across state lines, and they work together uh, on, on these kind of warrants being served without the use of a federal task force. Yeah. Yeah, and it, part of what is so hard to reconcile in, in this age of social media, I mean, you can see all kinds of information about Brandon uh, Weber, the, 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 the young man who was killed. Um, you can see that he was um, a really good, he was a loved student at Central High School. He was a father. Um, he had many friends and family members that are, and I don't know why I, I look at you or I can look at any of us, but I'll start with Jared. I mean, it is just so hard to reconcile what his friends and family are saying about him and the pain they obviously mm -hmm. feel with what he is accused of doing prior to the shooting. Well, I guess I have a, a bit of an interesting insight. Uh, one, just as a young man who came from a community who I, 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 think, is, I think is pretty similar, uh, but also, I spent a lot of time outside of Brandon's family home yesterday talking to his uncle and, and sort of gauging the mood of people who were mourning him in their own way. Uh, and, you know, his uncle was very honest with me. You know, Brandon was a straight A student and Brandon cared a lot about school, but Brandon lived in the streets mm -hmm. and Brandon had to have a pistol. And, you know, he, was, he wasn't the type of kid that was dumb enough to, in, in his uncle's words, uh, up his pistol at, at the side of authority, uh, but he he his, Brandon's uncle, uh, his name was Carlos, felt like you know this is a kid who who needed uh, to survive in that environment, and he he also you know shared with me that he, he felt a bit responsible because he thought that Brandon looked up to him in those circumstances, and he felt like he'd given that life life up quite a while back, but he didn't express enough to Brandon that this was not the way to go. So. I mean, there's a Facebook video, I think, that he, it was on Brandon's Facebook page of him where he's selling some marijuana, and his, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, we linked to it from a story we did, others may have as well, I don't, I mean, obviously everybody in town has covered this, I don't want to just focus on the Daily Memphian, but his friend Michael Cole wrote a very painful, very heartfelt kind of remembrance of him that don't judge him, wait to learn more, talked about, yeah, he may have sold drugs, but that was how he made money. Um, it, it was a, it's a fascinating thing that we link to. It's on Medium by DeMichael Cole. But, it, 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 go ahead. Gabriel. But 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 that's that's one one source of of the discussion that, that is underway, because this becomes a process that that has happened in in every incident that is generally similar to this, where where someone is killed by police or wounded by police. There is this process that, mm -hmm. that takes place. And as a result, the person who is no longer there to defend themselves or to explain themselves becomes either or. Yeah. They, they become either the straight A student or they become the person who's the drug dealer. And, and I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we, we, we know that none of us are the extremes in our lives. We are a combination of all of those things. And so, it, I think that process that Bill is talking about has become, uh, well, it's sad, number one, that this has become a process, right, that we have to go through this uh, enough times where we can kind of understand the rhythm of the episodes, you know. Uh, but it is uh, really heartening that we are humanizing these people and, and trying to look at all different facets of it. You've got a, a photo there that shows him as a, a father and a graduate and, a, a, you know, all those other things. Uh, but the Hernando area district attorney, John Champion, said that uh, no doubt that uh, they were dealing with a very violent person. Mm -hmm. and, and what he did was, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was awful. And, and the person that he shot five times is expected to make a full recovery. Uh, but he said, um, the, they said that it wasn't something they just went down their rough shot into Memphis trying to find somebody and this occurred. This was a violent felon who obviously uh, did not want to go to jail. And you know they ended up, from my knowledge, having to do what they had to do, and yeah. um, and, and that's so that's sad. The DA at Hernando. That's the DA in Hernando, uh, and and every bit of it is sad, and and hopefully, 
uh, something will change this time. I don't know. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the coverage, and we've tried to do it. Other people, I mean, I used to do Commercial Appeal, you all, I mean, the TV people, the media, the coverage of crime and coverage of a big incident like this to try to find to, to that sort of struggle to be to get the news out there, but also to humanize, to not jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's guilty. The police say he jumped out with it, you know, ram their vehicle, and he had a gun and. But, you know, I'm not saying anyone is, is deceiving. It's just sometimes the facts as they play out, it takes weeks, not hours, to figure out what really happened. That's it right. takes weeks, not hours, to figure out who these people involved really are. And that, that's just an interesting struggle that I think everyone's trying, all the media organizations to varying degrees are trying to, how do we, how do we have a bigger picture on what's going it, on, it, not the narrow, quick hit? It, exactly. it, 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 it's also a couple of, there are also a couple of things going on. There is, who is Brandon Weber? And then there are the questions about, okay, no matter who Brandon Weber was and what he was accused of, was this the right way for law enforcement to right. handle right. handle right. the situation? Right. Well, a lot of the community members in Frazier and a lot of people who are outside of Brandon's home ask the same question and it is why so often when a situation like this arise and it, it uh, involves a young black man, it's always fatal force that, well, so often we see that case. When you, I think about, you know, uh, Charlotte and the church shootings, uh, why someone like Dylan Roof is able to be apprehended. That's mm -hmm. a very violent situation, uh, but why so often young black men in similar situations are able to be brought in safely. Mm -hmm. And I really hope during this episode, if, if there's anything that we take from this, I would love for Memphis to be the place that figures this out, the, the place that we can innovate uh, convene a task force, get people together to talk about our responses to stuff just like this. So whoever's out there and listening, uh, boy, it would be really, really great if Memphis could put its stamp on this and say, we figured out how to do these situations is, better. Yeah, I mean, it's part of a whole national dialogue. It's part of a national, I mean, this is not uniquely a Memphis That's right. incident in any sense whatsoever. Well, in a perfect world, we just not have instances like this yeah. where, you know, people are in, you know, just violent situations and, you know, police don't have to respond in this way. You know, there's a bigger question about our youth and how we can keep them out of situations right. like this. I mean, how, again, if you take the, the narrative at face value, how does a kid who is a, a great art student at Central High School, who is a great student, who did well in his ACT, who was enrolled in college, if, how is that reconciled with what he's accused of doing that, that, that led up to this. And, and if, if, if you look at the area uh, that this all took, took place in, the area where, where he died, there, there are so many other conflicting things going on. There are a, a, a number of churches in that area, as there are all across the city. There are a number of, of second chance uh, programs there for, for ex-felons. Um, there's also an apartment complex not too far from there, which is under one of the no gang injunctions. Yeah. Uh, so th there's a there's quite a mix of things going on in that community, and the terrain can change from one part from one street to the next. Well, yeah. and isn't if I'm not mistaken, with um, uh, Memphis 3.0, the strategic plan isn't one of the anchor areas somewhere in in, near, in or near Fraser, yes. right? I mean mm -hmm. that that the city and the, the that whole planning process identified the importance and the historical importance of Fraser. The Firestone plant is very much on everybody's mind. Right. Can the city get a hold of the Firestone plant, which has been abandoned many years ago, and remediate it and 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 do something with that that would bring economic activity back to, to Fraser and, of some sort. And, and this is the landscape in which this young man's life unfolded. And and I think some of the discussion uh, uh, about this, you know, that personality is is kind of forgotten. Those conflicts, that those factors in his yeah. life are forgotten because he becomes a poster child for essentially both viewpoints right. here. Yeah, right. yeah. And just to kind of put a finer point on what I was saying earlier, uh, Brandon Weber was innocent. He, he was never proven guilty uh, in a court of law. And uh, but then on the on the flip side of that, if he was grabbing for a rifle and put officers' lives in danger, I wasn't there. I don't know how the situation went down. I'm not passing judgment on anybody, but uh, but uh, it was just a, a sad episode. Yeah. Well, some I want to one quick question. Will we have body camera footage? Do we know? Did the marshals do that? Don't we don't know. don't we know don't. Okay. don't know about the marshals, uh, the Memphis police. Okay. Uh, I'm being told that they apparently they do not. So do not so there's that. Okay. I want to segue into we talked about the People's Convention and the political season because crime and and all these things are are 
they are political issues. They are what people look to their government leaders for. But I was going to read a couple of things that the Mayor Strickland had to say and one of his challengers, Tammy Sawyer, the, the uh, county commissioner. Uh, Mayor Strickland, I'll just read a couple of quick things. I'm impressed by the, the professionalism and incredible restraint showed by the first responders as they endured concrete blocks being thrown at them, people spitting at them. The aggression toward our officers was unwarranted. He also said, though, uh, and this he may have said to you, Bill, um, about um, Brandon Weber, the loss of one life is tragic, and I do grieve for the loss of this young man, and I grieve for his family. Um, it, it, what, what next for the mayor, do you think? I mean, is it, the mayor said he was going to go to Frazier and meet with community leaders. Is that what's I, next, you think? I, th I think there will be ongoing dialogue about that. The Frazier Exchange Club meeting that, that Jared talked about is, is a weekly gathering that is kind of a place where all of the different organizations work and come together on a weekly basis and talk about that. And, and there are a lot of groups doing a lot of work in Frazier, and I believe that will be where the discussion starts. Let me uh, say, uh, just quote from Tammy Sawyer, I believe most of this was on Twitter. She said, I can't believe that move was made. This was about the tear gas, and we haven't mm -hmm. focused as much on the, the police response. We talked some about the police response to the protesters that night. Um, don't judge Frazier, she said, this is Tammy Sawyer, without asking the community how it feels to mourn their youth over and over again. What do people do with their pain and trauma when it gets to be too much, when a city has ignored, ignored them, when their loss is too great and they can no longer yell at the sky? And that is Tammy Sawyer, who is also is a county commissioner and is a, a prominent member of local political, the younger movement of, of um, politicians and came out of kind of the protest movement, right? I mean, of Black Lives Matter and the yes. bridge um, shut down. How does, I don't know who wants to take this, how does this, does this incident play into the mayor's race that's right around the corner? I think it does. I, I, I think that this conversation was, was inevitable as a part of the mayor's race, and I think it's now pretty much front and center in yeah. the race. There was, there was always going to be a discussion about this as part of the mayor's race and as part of the city elections. Uh, at, the, at that Fraser Exchange Club meeting, there were a lot of comments about, uh, I remember one, one pastor spoke specifically to uh, his disappointment with local leaders who didn't say enough uh, in support of the community of Fraser and of the people who were outside hurting and also just uh, Weber's family rather than, uh, you know, just giving their, uh, their thoughts and their prayers and their feelings towards law enforcement, local law enforcement, which a lot of them were injured in, in, mm, in this yeah. incident. There was a kind of an interesting discussion uh, about that protest that night um, that, uh, uh, you know, CNN called it a melee, uh, and then the NAACP called it a riot on, on their Twitter page, and Tammy Sawyer uh, said that uh, the word riot distracts and distances people from the depth of what's occurring and allows them to turn their backs on the community expressing hurt. I think this is another step in that process that Bill was talking about earlier, how how do we respond to, to it all and what do we call it? I think those are interesting uh, conversations happening now. Yeah, and you mentioned it is a good thing. <clears throat> a number of community leaders who went there to, were, they got hit by rocks as well. Journalists, mm -hmm. I mean, got gas. There was tear gas. I think somebody from Channel 3 ended up being hospitalized. He turned, it turned out he was fine. But some 20-something um, uh, first responders were injured. And so all that plays into this as well. That there was a lot going on in the crowd, in any crowd like that. So while there were people throwing bricks, there were also pastors who were telling people to go home mm -hmm. at the same time. Sure. Um, we'll, we'll segue, I mentioned the People's Convention, uh, Bill. Tell, for folks who don't know, what, what is the People's Convention? What was it and how does that play into this mayor's race that we've been talking about and, the, and maybe even the council races? The People's Convention is, is, uh, has been organized by Up the Vote. It's a, it began as kind of a successor to the 1991 African American People's Convention that made was, was a key part of the process that made Willie Harrington the consensus challenger to Dick Hackett in the 1991 elections. This is a successor to that, obviously a different context for it, but it was organized by a group called Up the Vote 901, uh, very much representative of the new generation of activism and political involvement that we've seen over the last five years or so. Uh, the gathering was at the Paradise Entertainment Center, what many people will know as uh, formerly as Club Paradise. Uh, drew a crowd of about 600 people, uh, 200 of which voted electronically after hearing from candidates in different races who sought the uh, convention's endorsement and a slate of candidates. Um, it, it's not really a poll, it's a gathering of those who are politically involved who commit to do whatever they can 
to help get these candidates elected. And at the top of the ticket is County Commissioner Tammy Sawyer, who is, who is among the challengers to Jim Strickland in the race at the top of this year's ballot, the race for mayor. And am I right that Jim Strickland decided not to, to go, felt like it was kind of preordained that, that Tammy was going to win? I think uh, former Mayor Harrington said the same thing. Is that yes, it? yes. Okay. I, I had, to be fair. I, I had talked to him at the outset and said, uh, okay, are you going to go? And he said, well, I'm going to seek any endorsement that I can get. But at that time, there was a pledge that, that the convention organizers scrapped later on where they were going to require the candidates to uh, – promise that they would withdraw from the race if they didn't get the People's Commission. He said, well, if that's in place, I probably won't go. Harrington uh, made, said that he thought that it was impossible to repeat, to repeat the importance of the 91 convention. For those, the, the, the vote for mayor and council races is when? When does early voting start, give or take? Early voting starts in mid-September. So the election away. day is okay. October 5th. And the candidates have until noon of ne mid-next month to, uh, to, to file, to file their file petitions. So. Okay. Unless I, we'll move on to a couple other stories that you all have been working on um, as we segue out of politics and out of what happened in Frazier. Uh, one is on housing, and, that, and it's a strange segue, and I, but I will own it that right now, I mean, there is this, there is, there, even as this happened in Frazier, even as a prominent member of a, a Glenn Colfield was, was tragically killed in a random robbery, which we won't go into, but it was just a tragic and very upsetting thing for a lot of people. It, felt, it was echoes of Phil Trenary. It felt random. It felt different. It, there's a lot of complicated issues b beyond that and why it felt different. But against that is a booming economy in Memphis in many ways. That's and right. housing is part of that. And uh, the, the story that's on the racks uh, on, the, on the flyer today uh, it's called Boomtown, and, and it is. Uh, according to some uh, numbers I looked at, more than $14 billion of investment in Memphis since 2014, uh, either finished, underway, or, or in the pipeline. And you can see it all over town. You can see we don't have the, the cranes like downtown Nashville has uh, because our boom is a little bit different. You know, we, we kind of go in and we renovate, and we, we do those things kind of the Memphis way. Um, and uh, but that boom has a lot of people worried that we will turn out to be like a city like Nashville where home prices are insane and uh, traffic is crazy but everybody I talked to didn't seem to think we're really heading down that way home prices are up just slightly rents are up just slightly uh, and it seems like there's gonna be room for everybody here uh, but uh, but it is exciting when you get out there and you see these these developments happening all over the place and one other growing pain out of that is uh, some of these developers uh, they'll go into a, like a classic midtown neighborhood and kind of put up a new modern looking building and it really sets the historic preservationist people uh, on edge and uh, it's just a part of the growing pains we're going through. Yeah, and you've got, I mean, interesting, like in Cooper Young, you've got interesting issues of, of kind of a, a kind of gentrification. You've got mm -hmm. streets where you've got houses that are being renovated and listed for $300,000 plus who, that are right next to long, houses that have been held and owned by families forever that are probably worth $50,000 and that, I, you know, that, that process is interesting to watch too. But the other part is you did a story, what, last week on, on a, a kind of historic building sure. that is in the, uh, in this boom town, got in this boom town mix. Absolutely. Well, you know, we think of Bill Street as a historic street, but, uh, you know, in my lifetime, uh, I was born right in sort of the, the onset of this re revitalization of Bill Street. I was born in the early nineties. And so, uh, this association that we have of it as a, as a center of good times wasn't always, you know, my experience mm -hmm. or the experience of the people around me. Uh, but 380 Bill, which uh, I, starting the story, I had almost no clue just how important this early history was as a, as a cinema and how it uh, related to Muhammad Ali and, and his involvement in that development uh, was one of the sort of first new buildings, Bill, if I'm correct, uh, to sort of set off some of these things that before the new a, district, uh, right, mm -hmm. right, and uh, well, over the years, and especially even even you know in my days in high school, it was it was it was a nightclub, and it was place it was a place that uh, people could go uh, for high school parties, college parties, these sorts of things because it was being rented out. But it was definitely a, a dangerous place, and even at, at in my days, uh, it was thought of as sort of the older hip hop club. It was mm -hmm. it wasn't as nice as some of the ones in Parkway Village and Hickory Hill, so on and so forth. But it is. A, an epicenter and a mecca of some of these things that we think of today, there would be no 36 Mafia and an Oscar without uh, 380 Bill first, uh, and there would be no uh, 
global uh, understanding of what Jukin is if there was not a 380 bill first. And so when you talk about Memphis and music tourism, which is a big part of this Boomtown thing, it's sort of, that's one big element of it. Uh, where does hip hop fit into that? If where is where is the place that we can go and see a plaque? Uh, the same way that you can go to the Chiska Hotel and hear about Dewey Phillips, or you can go to Sun Studios, you can go to Graceland, uh, you can go to Soulsville and see uh, Stacks, you could go to uh, Willie Mitchell Boulevard and, and and visit Royal. Where does hip hop fit in that conversation? How do we move our musical tapestry forward? So. Yeah, will you tell the quick story of Muhammad Ali? Fighting uh, uh, Willie Harrington, Mayor Harrington. Uh, no, actually, it, w it was Congressman Harold oh, Ford, Harold Ford. Sr. That's right. uh, but yeah, Muhammad Ali, as, as as Jared turned up in in his research on the story, was originally a part owner of the theater. It was originally a movie theater in in the 1970s. So Muhammad Ali came to town and did an exhibition boxing match. He was still boxing at the time, and uh, so Congressman Harold Ford Sr. got in the ring with him. And his his son, Congressman Harold Ford, form, future Congressman Harold Ford Jr., was by the ring and kind of saw his dad getting beaten up and jumped into the ring <laughs> and and started taking on Muhammad Ali. My the, mind is blown the, again. There sure. we go. Yeah. That is all. I love that story. I think we've told it before, but it's a great story and a great history. Thank you all for being here to talk about a tough subject. And thank you for listening. Join us again next week. <laughs>